The recurring crisis of stewardship is not about money. It's not about money, time, and talents. It's about the self who gives or who does not give, the self who is constituted and identified and perceived and presented and situated because a self that is wrongly constituted, wrongly identified, wrongly perceived, wrongly presented, wrongly situated will never be generous. Paul states the problem starkly. Do not lie to one another seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with a new self which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. It's about old self, new self. And as I talk about this, think about how you are clothed in an identity, and then identify someone who you know who just can't be generous, and imagine how they are clothed. These four readings that are assigned for today offer us four case studies on the old and the new. In the letter to the Colossians, the old self is a practitioner of greed, anxiety, and alienation. And Paul says, put to death greed, that's the 10th commandment, which is idolatry, that's the first commandment, and anger and malice and all that stuff that tears up the body. This old self is unsettled and is out of sync and lives in anxiety. In the psalm, we sang the good part. Of course, we always sing the good part. The part that we skipped over says, here I'm quoting, the dullard cannot know, the stupid cannot understand. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. <laughs> so the old self is too bored or too dull or too preoccupied to notice the goodness of God's love. And when we do not notice, we are on our own. In Isaiah 55, the poem is addressed to the Jews in Babylon who have signed up with the empire. So the poet reminds them that in the good news of God there is free water and free milk and free bread and free food. But then in verse 2, he says to the Jews in Babylon, why do you spend your money for that which does not satisfy? Why do you bust your ass for stuff that will never make you happy? It is the big stewardship question. Why do you labor for that which will not satisfy? Why do you pursue a life that cannot promise happiness? Why are you caught in the endless game of accumulation and control? Why do you give your time and energy to the empty promises of the empire? And in the fourth case study, the gospel reading, there is this rich young ruler who punctiliously obeys all of the commandments. He meets the quotas. He remembers what his mother told him. He plays by the rules. But he is haunted because he knows it's not right and it's not enough and it's not good enough. But he cannot imagine walking in to the gifts because he was very rich, because he had great possessions, because he had a lot of baggage. He had a big control zone that would not let him inherit eternal life. Well, that's a fast company. The old self at Colossae, the dullard in the Psalms, the rat race in Babylon, and the rich man in the gospel, be glad they are not your stewardship officer. <laughs> These several texts describe folk among us, and maybe us on a bad day, who are smitten by the narrative of anxious greed that compels our consumer society. 
And even as we pursue the rat race, we know down deep, like the rich guy, that that is not the truth of our life. So the news that keeps coming in these lessons, the news is that there is another way. In Colossians, having clothed yourself with the new self, according to the image of the Creator, and then Paul details the new self. As God's chosen one, holy and beloved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, Clothe yourself with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you are indeed called in one body. The new self is ready for brothers and sisters, and did you know, notice the one word that is repeated three times is forgive, forgive, forgive. Break the cycle of alienation and resentment. And there is no doubt that the word forgive, that has become a theological word in the first instant, is an economic word. It has to do with forgiving debts, forgiving about money, and entering a new zone of generosity. In the psalm, the new self is filled with gratitude. It is a good thing to give thanks, to sing praises to the Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning, your faithfulness by night, with lute and harp and lyre. You gotta sing it. And the psalm goes on to say, people who do that, are like a well-watered tree in an arid culture, staying green. Isn't it wonderful that the psalmist knew about going green even before the oil spill? And in Isaiah 55, the part of the chapter we didn't read, it's about the Jews coming home to the promised land. It's about the Jews coming home to God. It's about all of God's creatures coming home to the Creator, and the, the, the Isaiah must have been an Episcopalian because he imagines a great procession. <laughs> he says, you shall go out in joy, and you shall be led back in peace, and the mountains, and the hills, and the myrtle, and the cypress, they'll all gather by the road, and they will applaud, and they will sing, and they will dance, because you're coming home to your true self. And in the Gospel reading, the new self is the one who sells what he has, gives to the poor, and has treasure in heaven. So the tension in all four of these readings is about old, new, it's about either or in Colossians, it's old self or new self. In the psalm, it's either stupidity or flourishing. In Isaiah, it's about being unsatisfied in the empire or being on your way rejoicing. And in the gospel, it's either being sad or following. So the issue is to arrive at a rooted self who does not give in to the narrative of consumer capitalism with its military fearfulness. The task of stewardship is to help people imagine life outside of that lethal narrative. The task of stewardship is to be re in a self of generosity and gratitude, 
categories that are foreign language to the old self. So consider the language of old self reclothed as new self is very likely a baptismal formula. Baptism is about being reclothed, renamed, re-identified, which is why babies wear all those fancy clothes at baptism, because they are reclothed. And in my Calvinist tradition, we have a theological phrase that says, life consists in perfecting your baptism. The Eucharist is a meal of generosity that breaks the vicious cycles of scarcity and anxiety and greed. The Eucharist is an exhibit of God's generosity of bread, of wine, which in my church is called the welcome table. That's what African Americans call it. What a table! A table where there's enough and everybody can come. Because the table of consumer capitalism is not welcoming. That table is filled with grudging and calculating and controlled scarcity that generates fear. That table is about an unreachable quota for whatever you're supposed to be doing. That table keeps us vigilant because we need to keep our stuff and get some more from somebody else. There is no generosity at the unwelcome table. But now, you prepare a very different table for me in the presence of mine enemies and in the presence of my fears, and in the presence of my desires, and in the presence of my lacks. It is a very different table to which we come. So if you think about baptism and Eucharist as the ground of stewardship, all of life is a brooding sacramental gift. And without that sacramental rootage, life becomes a series of quid pro quo transactions. So you may imagine this company and those with whom you do stewardship, and you and I, are all of us hoping to arrive at another table beyond our tired selves. Now you may think, as I sometimes do, that to be resituated and redefined by this mystery of generosity and gratitude, you may think that is impossible. And I think that sometimes too because I know my old self too well. That's not the first time this question has come. It came up in Luke 18. And the Lord of the narrative said to the rich guy, the Lord of the narrative said to his disciples who were called to be stewards, the Lord of the narrative said, what is impossible for human persons, impossible for human persons is possible for God. What is impossible for man, we used to say, is possible for God. So imagine stewardship as moving us toward and living in the impossibility that is God's good gift. Here's the news. Before God finishes with us, we shall become new selves, praising our Savior all the day long, going out in joy, walking in the light of shalom, no longer petty or calculating or grudging. 
So we try on the new clothes of generosity to see what it would feel like to be newly situated, newly identified, newly perceived, newly presented, newly named. Not going away sad with our great possessions, but heirs to the kingdom. This is indeed impossible. But as you come to the table, remember the God who does impossible things for whom all things are possible. It is very good news for people like us.